Hello and welcome to Cyrus Forum. My name is Miriam Imar Sadegi, and today we have three esteemed experts on Iran. Our topic is fostering stable political transition in Iran, lessons from other country contexts. Just a few words before we begin. Um, we started Cyrus Forum about a month before the brutal killing of Mahsa Amini, and our chief goal is to foster readiness for political transition in Iran so that Iranians can um, make the, uh, the hard um, uh, transformation from tyranny to uh, democratic uh, freedoms. Um, we will do more of these kinds of discussions. We have done several, both in Persian and English so far. And uh, I want to say welcome to uh, Danny Pletka, Ruel Markarecht, and Michael Rubin. Um, it's an honor to have you. Thank you for making time. So uh, why this topic? Um, why are we talking about fostering stable political transition? Um, we don't know where, when there is going to be that uh, tipping point or uh, breakthrough in Iran, but we do know that there has been unprecedented dissent, particularly in the last, last nine, 10 months. And Ruel and Ray Take have written a, a lot about this. I have also, really everyone here has written about the protests and strikes and the unprecedented um, revolutionary sentiment, uh, the dissent in Iran. But peaceful transition um, upon regime collapse or overthrow is by no means guaranteed. Even before such a transition, there exists potential for deepening internal conflict. Just today, um, the Komale uh, political party of Kurdistan um, had conflict within itself and two uh, members of this party have been killed. Uh, the issue of uh, preparedness for transition in Iran is not one that is uh, often discussed among policymakers. Uh, the strategic planning, capacity building, policymaking is uh, really lacking in this regard, in my view. So we will get into some fault lines for potential conflict. Um, the revolutionary sentiment itself Right now, there is a tremendous amount of vitriol, distrust, and division in the opposition, unfortunately. And there are very strong signs of infiltration and manipulation by the regime um, of the opposition. There is a heavy, heavy uh, level of repression. There's ethnic tension and regime crackdowns in ethnic minority areas in particular. I mentioned the, the tension within um, ethnic communities, such as Kurdistan. Um, water issues are a very severe economic strife. The IRGC and what will happen with it before, after transition, fissures the international mafia of the IRGC. How is that all going to pan out? And the proxy militias. These are just some of the uh, potential fault lines for um, uh, violent conflict. Um, we will benefit from the comparative experience and perspective of our panelists, and we will be bringing in in this discussion lessons from other country contexts to the Iranian case. Um, each panelist will speak about five to seven minutes. Um, I will ask a couple of follow-up questions on their presentations, and then we will engage in a free discussion among all of us. This will take about an hour in total. So we'll begin with Ruel Mark Garekt. Um, Ruel is a former Iranian targets officer in the Central Intelligence Agency and is a resident scholar at FDD, Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He was previously a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and director of the Middle East Initiative at Project for New American Century. Ruel is the author of many books, including Know Thine, en know Thine Enemy, A Spy's Journey into Revolutionary Iran. Uh, he has been a correspondent for the Atlantic Monthly, as well as a frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Dispatch, and other publications. Ruel, thanks for being here, and please begin. My pleasure. I mean, I think the first thing I would say is it's a pity my, uh, uh, that Misach Parsa, who was, uh, until his retirement, was at Dartmouth, because I think he's written the best discussion of this in his book, Democracy in Iran. Uh, and I have to say, you know, Misak's not terribly optimistic, and I don't think I disagree with him on the chances of p any type of peaceful transition in the Islamic Republic. Uh, 
I think the regime has shown itself to be fairly tenacious, and it's also shown itself to be violent. Uh, and I don't think you're going to see in the Islamic Republic, you know, sort of an evanescence, a fading away of the regime. Uh, and uh, I think the what the regime recently has demonstrated with the women's movement, um, if we want to call it that, uh, its willingness, for example, to poison young girls nationwide in an attempt to convince their parents that these uh, young women need to stop demonstrating uh, tells you uh, of its um, of its ruthlessness, if nothing else. So I'm I'm deeply skeptical you are going to be able to plot and plan or organize, uh, certainly outside of the country, uh, about how you're going to organize uh, a, a democratic Iran. Uh, I think it's going to be extremely difficult to do that. Uh, I don't think the expatriate population probably is prepared to do that. And internally, because of the efficiency and effectiveness of the Iranian security services, I don't think that's possible, obviously, inside. So it's tough. I mean, uh, I mean, Misach uh, went through country by country those that have, you know, worked, that uh, you've been able to get some type of uh, democratic transition where you've been able to do this with minimal bloodshed. And in none of those cases do you see anything that remotely looks like Iran. Uh, I mean, the one that uh, I like best uh, is, say, the South Korean military dictatorship. Uh, I mean, obviously, that was a country where, one, the United States had a great deal of influence. We don't have that inside of the Islamic Republic. We were actually in South Korea. And two, there was enough confidence, enough uh, social ties between the military and civilians uh, that the military was willing to give way uh, and did not fear that uh, it was going to be held accountable for any authoritarian sins. Uh, and it was unprepared, uh, obviously, to to do and didn't want to hang on. Uh, I mean, we know in the case of the Islamic, Islamic Republic, that's not true. Now, my friend Ray Take has a view, and I'm, I don't think I'm in agreement with him, that, uh, you know, the regime is prepared to actually kill on the scale uh, to withstand massive demonstrations amongst Persian Iranians. And I want to emphasize that, the majority, not the minorities. Uh, in that if you could see Persian Iranians uh, actually be willing to hit the streets in large numbers, I mean big numbers, not what we've seen, not a few hundred here or a thousand there, but really large numbers, that the regime would not be able to handle it because the regime's security services really aren't that large. And his view is that they're unprepared to really take on um, such demonstrations and kill the number of people necessary. Um, I'm skeptical of that. I actually think the regime probably is capable of killing uh, the number of Iranians necessary to, it certainly will not kill minorities. Uh, to, to handle any type of uprising. Now, I do think it's fragile uh, that the Islamic Republic doesn't have uh, uh, mobile security forces uh, in large numbers. Uh, so it is conceivable in my mind if you could actually see uh, significant demonstrations, much larger uh, than we have so far seen, something akin to what we saw and uh, Tehran and the Grieve movement, that I think you could crack the regime and you might crack it uh, fairly quickly. Uh, but we haven't seen that yet. Certainly we haven't seen that amongst uh, the, the, you know, the Persian core, the Persian heartland. And until you see that, I, I, I don't think, I think we're stuck with the regime. Uh, now, I think it's worthwhile to do, and certainly for expatriates, try to imagine ways uh, where they could establish, uh, you know, a democracy in Iran. I think it drives the regime nuts. Uh, so if the expatriates can actually do that and not end up fighting like cats, uh, 
uh, then I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. But so far, I think uh, expatriate dissidents haven't shown themselves to be able to cohere uh, and, you know, put, you know, put aside their differences, which are sometimes substantial, uh, to sort of develop, you know, I don't know if you need a single voice, but uh, certainly a movement, an organization uh, that could, uh, you know, keep the spotlight on this. Because as we've seen, I think Western governments are quite quick, quick enough uh, to move away from the issue of human rights, to move away from the issue of democracy in Iran, uh, and are going to fall back inevitably uh, to, one, the nuclear issue uh, and oil. So um, uh, I, I, the Iranians are really going to have to do this on their own. Uh, they're not going to get uh, much support. You're, I think the era, for example, of covert action support, that's not going to happen. Obviously, the Europeans are unwilling and, and aren't capable of doing that. And you're not going to have any bipartisan agreement on that in the United States. And unless you have bipartisan agreement, there is no such thing as any significant uh, American effort, either clandestine or more overt, uh, to support uh, Iranian dissidents and certainly support the cause of democracy in Iran. It's just not going to happen. So uh, I, I think with that, I'll, I'll stop. It's a little depressing, uh, but I, I think it's probably a fair description of where we are on this. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to take, for, take it for what it is. Right. So, um how much, Ruel, do you see U.S. policy under the Biden administration affecting the success of the movement? Or do you think that it's neither here nor there? Well, I would say if the Biden administration's actions uh, do have an impact on the movement, then the, imp uh, the movement obviously isn't, isn't ready to succeed. Um, so... Uh, you know, the Biden administration uh, obviously would like to have some type of, you know, arrangement with the Islamic Republic that they don't do the final step to detonating a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Uh, and so they want the Biden administration, above all else, wants to maintain the status quo. They have, I think they've already accepted Iran as a nuclear state. They've certainly accepted it as a nuclear threshold state. So its focus is going to be on that. Uh, not on any any conceivable human rights movement, democracy movement inside of inside of Iran. So, uh, like I said, Iranians have to do this on their own. And is it depressing to folks inside to see the United States turn away from uh, their 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 cause? I, I imagine it is. I mean, we know from the past, uh, from for example, dissidents uh, in within the Soviet Empire that uh, when Americans did turn their attention to their cause, if nothing else, it could be quite uplifting and fortifying for those who are having to do endure the pain of fighting against uh, uh, totalitarian regimes. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, um, Danielle Pletka. Danielle Pletka is a distinguished senior fellow in foreign and defense policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute where she focuses on U.S. foreign policy generally and the Middle East specifically. Until January 2020, Daniel was the Senior Vice President of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at AEI. Concurrently, she also teaches U.S. Middle East policy at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service. Before joining AEI, she was a senior professional staff member for the Middle East and South Asia for the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Daniel has authored, co-authored, and co-edited a variety of studies, monographs, and book chapters, including many on Iran. Danielle, thank you so much. War ears. I think you're muted. That is true. I am muted. Um, it's so nice to be on with all of you, uh, friends frankly. Uh, I don't think that there's a huge divergence of views among us, which is uh, potentially a little bit uh, a little bit boring for our listeners. Let me try and let me try and talk about some aspects that that Ruel didn't touch on, 
uh, perhaps. Uh, so I think all of the points that that he made about the size of the uh, the size of of, of opposition uh, and the size of the demonstrations and the number of people in the streets in in Iran I think is is well obviously accurate. We, the regime is still there. The, the, the demonstrations have waxed and waned o over the months, but uh, I think that the regime believes that they have them largely in hand, and uh, I agree. Th that is very much the case. So when you start talking about the prospects for, um, for a stable transition to a stable government, you can't help but think about some of the examples that have gone before. Right. So the first is uh, is to ask the question, transition to who? Um, because there's not just one option. So we have obviously a very large Iranian expatriate community, as Ruel intimated, um, uh, when they are not busy fighting with each other. Well, no, I can't say that. They're always busy fighting with each other. Um, in fact, you see very little effort to coalesce the various groups, whether it's the monarchists or others, um, together to, to have a coherent opposition to the regime. And I'm just talking about the United States here. So, you know, we also have very large expatriate communities. Well, some in the Middle East, but in London, in Paris, in, in, in Berlin and elsewhere, you have these huge Iranian expatriate communities, including people who left not at the time of the 79 revolution, who are now beginning to age, um, but people who left since, people who may have been too young or they may have believed in the revolution and turned on the regime since then. In other words, this isn't simply a group of, of Shah nostalgics that we're talking about in the Iranian diaspora. Nonetheless, they can't seem to sit down and agree among themselves. Absent that there is not going to be any external plan for a stable succession, let alone a plan for who would succeed the, um, uh, the Islamic Republic regime. Okay. Um, that's problem number one. Um, problem number two is the internal problem, right? Because if you look at a pecking order of possible successors to the regime, you have a whole variety of people, some of whom are not much more appetizing than the current inhabitants of, uh, of the halls of power inside Tehran, right? So you have the IRGC, the, um, you know, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. They have been accumulating vast amounts of power over the last 40 plus years. Plus, of course, they have um, an enormous leverage outside Iran. And when I say that, I don't mean in Europe, although they have tentacles in Europe and the United States and around Asia. But what I really mean is that they have their, um, they have their, their uh, what we used to call in the Cold War, their running dogs, right? So they've got Hezbollah, they've got the Houthis, they've got the Hashda Shabi in, uh, in Iraq. They have a lot of tools at their um disposal to actually exercise a certain amount of power and to project power in a way that is pretty influential. They also control, and let's not forget how important this is, a ton of money, a ton of money inside Iran, outside Iran, around Iran, near Iran, far away from Iran. They got a ton of money. They control businesses. They control other assets. And while the United States Treasury Department has been pretty vigilant about trying to cut those off when they find them, the reality is that the Iranians are ahead of us at every possible step, the IRGC. And then you go on from there. There are a whole series of others. You know, I, I, Mariam, you've heard me tell one of my favorite stories. Um, Michael, you'll remember his name. The uh, bloody hand sheet uh, guy. No, I don't remember his name. <laughs> okay. We're all useless. Um, uh, on the front co front page, cover of the Economist. Oh, Ahmed Bhatibi. Ahmed Bhatibi. Uh, 
Batebi. I knew it began with a B. Batebi. You remember my famous story about Batebi, which I think encapsulates everything you need to understand about the possibilities of transition inside Iran. He came, he was helped by a substantial number of people, many of whom we know, to get out of Iran. He was smuggled out of Iran. He was public enemy number one. His name was well known and not apparently forgotten to all but the most senile among us, me, Ruben, Ruel. Um, and, and so there were, uh, there were friends who wanted to arrange meetings, reached out to him. And what was his response? Do any of you remember? I can't meet with anybody until I talk to Noam Chomsky. It's like at that moment, you sort of think to yourself. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. No, I said bloody hand print guy, not bloody handshake guy. In any case, not to digress into the yeah. usual sort of circus among us. Um, <laughs> that's my point. Even internal to Iran, you have a group of people who have been so cut off from the external realities in the United States and in Europe that their hero, that their heroes are people like Noam Chomsky, who, in addition to being extraordinarily old and almost dead, are outside the halls of power and are so far on the fringes of politics as to be irrelevant. So you see, you have all of these issues absent some coalescence of people outside or people outside with people inside or some organizing force inside that actually brings together the disparate forces within the opposition, you are never, ever going to be able to manage a transition unless there is some massive externality, the Israelis attack, for example. And now I've blabbed way too long. I'm sure Michael is texting all of you behind my back and saying how boring I am. So now my turn to text behind your back, Michael, and say how boring you are. Go on. Okay, Danny, um, a piece of good news, uh, at least in my, in my view, is that Iranians um, who are very active, who are who are activists, who are civil society, since Ahmad Batebi left Iran, are much much more aware of and have a demand for um, liberal democratic values. So Noam Chomsky, for example, is is ridiculed um, and. People like Majida Tabakoli, uh, a very prominent dissident intellectual, or um, and many others really who are still inside the country, still paying the price, are um, have made it very clear on, a, on an intellectual level how Iran stands. Um, <laughs> how Iran Michael, stands. we can all see your messages <laughs> up on the screen. <laughs> Sorry, I'll behave. What, you don't, what, you, what you and your and your uh, and your listeners don't know is that we have all known each other for two plus decades yeah. and have the mature and have the maturity of three four year olds, unfortunately. At best. So, At best. Anyway, but you were talking about you were talking about the the intellectual development. Look, Mariam, if I may just sure. sort of respond to that. Yeah. You know, I have been sort of burned in the crucible on on the Iraqi opposition. And when I think about the Iraqi internal and external opposition, I think about people of great um, quality and yeah. some of much lesser quality, but smart, deep and with a professed commitment to very um, democratic uh, and capitalist and market values. The problem is when push came to shove, that wasn't as much the case. Well, and Daniel, that's let's also, let's, let's be honest, I mean, with the Iraqi opposition, uh, the only reason they cohered at all was because of considerable American input. Yes. Right. Yeah. I mean, th these are all fat. It's This is not to say that this will never happen. Because, you know, people said it would never happen in the Soviet Union. People said it would never happen in, in the Czech Republic or Romania or anywhere else. And it has. The problem is the much more trenchant example is what happened in the Arab Spring yeah. everywhere. Right. And this is, as Aurel said, a very brutal totalitarian regime, which, unlike the Soviet Union, when communism collapsed, is not pulling back with glass-nosed and perestroika, it's actually really doubling down on 
violent repression and and is has in fact i mean Khamenei as a person is a student of the kgb and the what went wrong from the from the from a dictator's perspective in uh central and eastern europe so um they seem to be calibrating the regime seems to be calibrating its level of repression so that it doesn't get caught on cnn as as much although it was of course very repressive but is is able to do the bare minimum level of repression that it needs to 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 not provoke outrage internationally enough to you know warrant a, a, a complete reversal of of, pol of of appeasement policies or even um, you know instigate some kind of humanitarian intervention militarily no, no, you know it's it's made sure none of that happens um, and then now that things are much less under control as far as the level of protest and strikes goes it's deepening it's it's deepening its repression. I mean, it's ugly to say it, but I mean, poisoning young girls may have worked. A lot of, yes, a, a lot of things. I mean, it's no small thing. The regime itself admitted that the majority of people that it had imprisoned were children and amnesty and amnesty has documented the, the systematic uh, torture of those many thousands of children imprisoned and people I mean, more importantly, much more importantly to that, the average person in Iran knows that this is happening and the level of terror and fear, I think, is very, uh, very high. OK, let's transition to Michael Rubin. Michael Rubin is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in Iran, Turkey and the broader Middle East. A former Pentagon official, um, Michael has lived in post-revolution Iran. Yemen, and both pre- and post-war Iraq. He also spent time with the Taliban before 9-11. For more than a decade, he has taught classes at sea about the Horn of Africa and Middle East conflicts, culture, and terrorism to deployed U.S. Navy and Marine units. Michael is the author, co-author, and co-editor of several books, books exploring diplomacy, Iranian history, Arab culture, Kurdish studies, and Shiite politics, um, including including books that cover uh, Iran, such as Eternal Iran, Continu Continuity and Chaos, published in 2005. Of course, um, Michael is regularly publishing uh, shorter pieces in newspapers um, that often pertain to Iran. Uh, he has a PhD and an MA in history from Yale University, where he also obtained a BS in biology. So glad to have you, Michael. Please begin. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mariam. Um, I share the pessimism of Ruel and to some extent Danny, but let me just outline the best possible outcomes, because when it comes from the to the US perspective, too often we are so busy counting the trees we lose sight of the forest, we lose sight of what our end goal is. And even though it may seem fanciful or even impossible to reach a situation where Iran would be living at peace uh, with itself and its neighbors in a democratic system in which the ordinary Iranian people would have their freedom, have their liberty, the Iranian government would be held accountable, there are a few data points out there that could give reason for optimism. First of all, in Iran, democracy is not a foreign concept. Iran had an experiment with democracy in the first decade of the 20th century. And what's actually interesting about the constitutional revolution and what came later is just as with the most recent protest movement, Iran was at its most democratic because perhaps it didn't have any single figure around which all of the political establishment rallied. Later on when it did, be it Reza Khan, uh, who became Reza Shah, be it Ayatollah Khomeini, be it Mohammad Reza Shah, that's when democracy evaporated. But in those early years, not a foreign concept. Now, it's also important to remember that Iran could be a force for stability. This is why the United States and the outside world needs to remain engaged in Iran, even if the ultimate decisions with regard to this issue are gonna be made by Iranians alone. What happens in Iran 
doesn't stay in Iran. And if we look at all the areas that Iran has tried, that the current regime in Iran has tried to interfere with, destabilize, and so forth, if those were, um, if Iran were flipped to a, a force for stability, we'd be looking at a very different Middle East, and for that matter, a very different Africa um, and and Asia. Now. We do have a number of unknowns, and Ruel talked a lot about this, and I largely agree with him. Will the Islamic Revolutionary Guard shatter? It frustrates me to no end that we often talk about hardliners and reformers in politics, but we somehow treat the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps somehow homogenous. The fact of the matter is they're not homogenous, and understanding the fault lines within that organization is what is key to any sort of successful successful transformation in Iran. They're basically Khamenei's Praetorian Guard. There can't be any muddle through reform until the Islamic Revolutionary Guard fractures. So what's our strategy on that? Will the successor to Khamenei be a single person? I mean, technically it doesn't need to be. You could kick the can down the road and have a council of leadership and that would have any number of complications involving factional politics and so forth. But it's something to keep in mind. Too often we remain trapped by what we know in the current situation, and we forget that there's many more possibilities. When it comes to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, will there even be a transition or will it simply be um, filibustered? You know, when Oman, the Sultanate of Oman had its transition constitutionally, they needed to complete their transition in 48 hours. In Iran, there's a process, of course, with the assembly of experts and so forth, but there's no timeline associated with that process. And so we're likely to have a situation in which the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is not gonna subordinate itself to a new leader or leaders unless they feel that the, that leader or leaders are under their thumb. I mean, Khamenei was a compromise candidate. That's no law. I mean, now the factions are too big, perhaps, to balance. And that, that's also a reason to believe that even in the long term, where ordinary Iranians and their thirst for liberty might triumph, in the short term, it's going to be one heck of a fight. Um, the only optimism I have here with regard to this is some of the most fraudulent movements, for example, the Mujahideen al haq who have been very, very successful at attracting attention in the West, frankly, because they bribe a lot of people through donations and so forth, are going to be exposed as being completely without influence, completely without power, and completely irrelevant. And so even if we face a much broader fight into the future, it will be good to be able to throw Miriam Rajavi into the dustbin of history, where, quite frankly, she belongs. Now, you asked your question about what parallels are there. And I agree with what Danny just said with regard to what we've seen with the Arab Spring and quite specifically with regard to Syria. Perhaps the lesson Syria took in the Arab Spring was not to give up the way Tunisia, Ben Ali or Egypt did. Now, Egypt's an actual and interesting parallel there, however, because why did Hosni Mubarak lose his position? It's because the Egyptian military, which dominated business in the same way that the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps distorts the Iranian economy, decided that their best outcome would be to protect and preserve their business income. And if that meant getting rid of Mubarak, so be it. So there's an Egypt parallel. There's well, also the, Michael, the Egypt parallel is, I mean, there really was no revolution. It was just well, musical and, chairs. Well, can, we can debate that at a different time. Yeah. But yes, I, I mean, what I find interesting with regard to Egypt is not so much the first revolution, but the so-called counter-revolution, how millions of people on the street change sides. But I want, I want to keep my focus right now on a different point, which is... There's a parallel with China, because when we look at how the Iranians have repressed ordinary Iranians in the current protest movement, they've learned their lesson from Ahmed Batebi in 1999, 
they no longer bash heads because they know that will only increase anger. What they do is they use facial recognition software. They, and they identify people, and then they arrest them in the middle of the night three weeks later, when they're not surrounded by friends, when they're not surrounded by family. And that's something, a tactic which they've learned from China. There's also a parallel, if I may, with North Korea. I mean, if we look at, for example, the history of the Chinese-North Korean relationship or the Russian-North Korean relationship, there's a parallel here to what we see with regards to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iraq. Now, when I'm in Iraq, most people assume that when it comes to the Iraqi militias, the Iranian-controlled Iraqi militias, that Iran is funding them. In reality, for several years, the flow of money has been going the other way. The Iraqi militias have been funding the Revolutionary Guard, have been funding Iran. These investments, which the Iranians have grown, have paid dividends. The reason I make the parallel to North Korea is we see how North Korea has come to the defense of Russia right now, decades after Russia has been supporting it or China has been supporting it. So the question becomes, when we talk about all these Iranian proxies, what might they do? I mean, it's a lot, even if Iranians don't want to fire on their friends, their neighbors, their family members, would the Houthis, would Hezbollah, would Qatayib Hezbollah, Asayib Ali al Haq? The fact of the matter is, Iran has formulated all these mercenaries who can do their dirty work. And for that, we need to worry about. The last point I'd make before turning the floor back over, and then we can discuss Rural's point. I didn't mean to be rude or cut you off. I just, um, before I lost my train of thought, is let me end on an optimistic note. I don't believe the immediate transition is going to be peaceful. And when we look at Iranian history, we also see a history in which um, the desire to secure Tehran leads to trouble around the periphery. Um, and that creates a, a period of weakness. Uh, it's going to be exacerbated now by all the neighboring countries who are going to want to interfere. However, Throughout Iranian history, the Iranians have proven resilience and all this nonsense about Iran falling apart in ethnic lines is just that. It's nonsense. People forget how Persian national or how Iranian nationalists the Azerbaijanis are, for example, up to including the supreme leader of Iran right now. What I would say, however, is after we pass that test, after we face that test, if we pass it successfully, we know who the next leaders of Iran are going to be. The next leaders of Iran are those who are in prison right now. And we've seen this in a number of other countries as well, where the political prisoners have communication with each other and they will be thinking deeply about what might happen. Iran isn't a country that's looking for external actors to come in and rescue them. They want external actors to support them but there is a whole generation of young Iranians right now that Khamenei and the regime simply cannot stamp out, and their address is in Avin prison. With that, let me turn the floor back over to you, Mariam. So powerful, so moving. Um, thank you so much, Michael, and thanks, thanks to all of you. Um, so I guess I will draw out the the, the tensions or the disagreements that 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 may exist between. Um, the the points of optimism from uh, what Michael is talking about and um, what I see is as Ruel and I think Danny too um, saying look the indicators aren't there for even long term um, as Michael said um, a, a peaceful end to this um, let me ask you, if you can, Ro, what say more about, because I know in the pieces that you've written with Ray Take, uh, at least some of them in the last year, there's, there is some optimism that Iranians can make a peaceful transition, or at least a transition of some kind, to democracy. Well, well, I mean, so, I think they could make a transition. I just don't think the, uh, the, the most important part is going to be peaceful. So it's a question of, you know, how you overwhelm the security services, particularly the Guard Corps, uh, and how many people have to die in that process. Okay. Uh, my guess is it's not going to be a small number. I mean, if you go back to the Islamic Revolution, what's impressive about that revolution is relatively few people died. 
Okay. Uh, and it overturned, uh, you know, Pahlavi society. Yeah. Uh, uh, the I don't think you're going to get a parallel to that with uh, what I think is coming revolution. I mean, I have I have little doubt that uh, you're going to get one of these days the unexpected spark uh, that overwhelms the system. But it's uh, it's impossible, I think, to predict when that happens. Uh, but I, I think it's likely it will happen. But uh, I, I don't think the regime is going to go down uh, peacefully. Uh, mm-hmm. And that unless the opposition is prepared uh, for the violence that's required, uh, the regime will will hold, hold forth. Okay. Michael, you, you talked about the IRGC and that, that it's not a monolith, that it's not homogenous, that there are important uh, fissures. To what extent do you think, and I'm thinking, you know, of, of Israeli policy, not just uh, not just uh, the foreign policies of the United States or other Western countries, to what extent are these governments really focused on that, and and you and maybe um, uh, um, using using those differences, using those uh, internal fights, perhaps, um, as, as leverage against the regime. I mean, we know that, for example, the Israelis have plants as far as the nuclear program goes, but how far does it go in terms of actually bringing down the regime? Are they Um, using that? I'm a little bit pessimistic or a little bit critical of the Israelis and for that matter, the Saudis when it comes to this, or for that matter, the United States. I mean, clearly, um, some foreign powers have been able to infiltrate Iran because they've been able to conduct successful operations against nuclear scientists and key um, members of, of um, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, for example, its ballistic missile program. That said, unfortunately, too many countries, including our own, um, are, in, are, are constantly in search of a magic formula, of some sort of shortcut. And we've been engaging in shortcuts right now for 40 years. If only we had a longer term strategy, then perhaps we wouldn't be in the situation we are now. So some of these magic formulas, which are guaranteed to go nowhere or even backfire, would be any sort of support for the Mujahideen al haq And that may be the Israelis, that may be the Saudis, that may be others. But I mean, again, that organization which participated in the Islamic Revolution is perhaps the only organization more or includes the only figures less popular than the Supreme Leader himself. Another aspect of that magic formula is this desire to play uh, the ethnic card in Iran. Mm. Perhaps the reason we do this is because in the United States, our sense of history is only 10 years long. But when we understand the history of Iran, it coalesced as a nation it had an identity predating the age of ethno-nationalism in Europe or elsewhere in the world. And therefore, this notion that it's going to easily fracture is simply wrong. And what I worry about is it's not that we're just trying something and doing no harm, but you're actually giving the Iranians an excuse to rally around the flag because Iranians might not like their regime. But at the same time, they are nationalistic. They are proud of Iran. And they don't want to basically excise a cancer with an ax when they could do so with a scalpel. Right. So the last thing I would say is we do have a lot of strategies, which I think could be tried, that in my view would be win-win. Let me give you one from the United States. The U.S. Navy has hospital ships, for example, like the USNS Comfort. We saw these in New York during COVID. Why don't we send the USNS Comfort or the USNS Mercy or one of our hospital ships to Dubai and offer Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps veterans free medical care? When I lived in Iran, one thing that was clear was that the Iranian government is horrible at veteran services. Mm -hmm. Whatever complaints we have in the United States, exponentially higher in Iran. Now, the Iranians would respond to that in two ways. Either they would let these guys go because it's easy enough to go to Dubai, or they wouldn't. If they let them go, that's a propaganda coup. That's an intelligence coup. It shows that the Islamic Republic is is falling apart, even its sworn defenders. Mm 
Michael, you could also have four million Iranians suddenly appear with Revolutionary Guard Corps documents. Okay. Dubai, oh. Say, oh, by the way, I need medical care. <laughs> All the better. Uh, propaganda coup. Uh, yeah. Let me finish. <laughs> the alternate is they're not allowed to go, at which point it increases internal dissension within the Islamic, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps ranks. Would there be a possibility that they would attack our ship in Dubai? Not with the United Arab Emirates holding so much Iranian money. So what I do think we need to do is stop some of the short-term ideas, try some things which haven't been tried with our immediate goal. We need two, two visions. Immediate goal, whether it's US, whether it's Israeli, whether it's Saudi, whether it's anyone else, should be to fracture the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, get them to turn on themselves. The long-term goal needs to be freedom for the Iranian people, not support for any autocratic government, or the downfall of Iran itself. And one thing which I'm worried about in the United States, I'm worried about in Israel, I'm worried about in some of the Arab countries. When I look at Iraq, one of the things that we were most unprepared for, that we didn't have the foresight for, we went from Iraq being our enemy under Saddam Hussein to overnight it becoming our friends. But because of the devastation of sanctions, we ruined the Iranian economy and we created a system of dysfunctional corruption that has been, we have been unable to repair and the Iraqis have been unable to emerge from. We need to start having some serious thought as to what the reconstruction of Iran is going to look like into the future. And if there's any lesson to be drawn from other countries, I would argue the first conclusion we need to make is that we should not be flooding Iran with, with cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really optimistic, Michael. I mean, we're not even going to get close to that. No, I mean, you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I would, I would bet that, uh, for, for, I mean, whatever disinterest you see now in the Islamic Republic, it's actually going to get even more if they, if they test a nuke. Uh, well, I, I, there's, there's, there just isn't any serious bipartisan. I don't even, I mean, even on the Republican side, which we'll just assume here might be more willing to do something and I, I that that's a big question mark uh, you, you know you, you can only do so much and I don't think there's much interest in, in having that type of sustained focus on the Islamic Republic I, I think I think it's just not a realistic scenario Go ahead. Okay, well, I'm going to push back on Rel. I understand your reading of the current American political situation I, I agree with it but you and uh, Danielle and I were all at that conference uh, in Gdansk in 2006 on the 25th anniversary of the Solidarity Movement. And one of the big issues that we were looking at there and people like um, Lekwalesa and others were discussing was the fact that when change came, no one knew in advance when change was going to come. It happened instantly and people were unprepared for it. There's no reason when we have a U.S. government the size that we are now that elements of the U.S. government which aren't focused on day-to-day -day politics can't be more involved in that. And certainly I'd say, look, there's no one better than FDD at some of these things. But within the system, just sparking the thoughts within our broader intelligence community, within our broader State Department and so forth, it would be a useful wake-up call. And um, so, look, I agree. Let me put it this way. I am pessimistic as you are, but I'm not defeatist. And the difference between being pessimistic and defeatist is with pessimism, you recognize the problems as you just enunciated, but then you have to figure out a way out of them. Okay, excellent. Let me ask all of you a question. and Danny, maybe you can comment first. Um, the way you see the sanctions on the Islamic Republic right now, are they, are they being used as a tool to to further our long-term interest in a democratic Iran, or are they only uh, focused on the short-term and the nuclear issue? I mean, going to Michael's point about IRGC fissures, do you see the sanctions as, as, as being a winning strategy on that front, or is it possible that the sanctions bring the IR, make the IRGC more coherent and, and tight with each other? Well, you know, I, I mean, I think both can be true. Um, the the aim of the sanctions since we first began imposing 
serious sanctions on Iran in 1992 has always been tactical, not strategic, right? It's always been first about their missile program, then about their terrorism, then about their nuclear program. But we don't have a vision for what we want from Iran. Um, and that goes for Republicans and Democrats. Um, right. I, I'd, I'd go further if Iran didn't have a nuclear program, but it was just a state sponsor of terrorism, just a supplier of advanced conventional and unconventional weaponry to our enemies, we wouldn't pay any attention to them at all. Right? That, at least, is, is, uh, is our experience if we look at other countries that are engaged in similar activities. I don't know. Lebanon, for example. In any case, um, so I think all of that is true. Has have the sanctions empowered certain elements within within Iran, including the ARGC? Of course they have. That's always going to be the case, right? Sanctions are, you know, and especially when you have uh, as mercantile and as innovative and um, and as as creative a society uh, as that that you have in Iran, including, by the way, among some of the worst people, you are going to find um, you are going to find people who work their get their their workarounds. Yeah, whether it's the black market or it's the illegal sale of oil, or and they're, and they're always going to have a client because the world is full of shitty people. But um, it, so you know, sanctions in the absence of a broader strategy is not a long-term solution for Iran. Sanctions in the absence of a broader strategy are a solution for the American politicians under pressure from people concerned about Iran to get this beyond the next election. Mm. That's sanctions, it. Sanctions are easy. Right. Thank so, and Policy yeah. is hard. Yeah, they're, they're easy. I mean, I, they obviously, uh, they have, I think, little relevance so far as the nuclear weapons program. They have not deterred the Iranians from developing nuclear weapons. Uh, I, they are of value in denying the regime hard currency. They are a blunt instrument. Uh, but most importantly for the United States, which has used sanctions consistently since the 18th century, they're just easy. So uh, you and you can you can get some bipartisan consensus to engage in sanctions. I mean, were it would that sanctions were part of a grander containment strategy? Uh, it's not going to happen. The United States isn't going there. But uh, it is something that we can do. It obviously has had some relevance. And I must say, uh, it has, uh, if you look at the demonstrations that have occurred since 2017, it's pretty bloody hard to find Iranians protesting against American sanctions. Uh, so uh, it obviously, the regime has been unsuccessful in turning that issue against the United States. Uh, and that will, I suspect, continue to be the case. Okay. If I may just add something there, Miriam. Absolutely. Um, to extend it further, um, I agree with what Danny and Raul just said, but to take this further, this is one of the main arguments why we also shouldn't have military strikes on Iran, because everyone agrees that military strikes might delay the nuclear program, but if we're simply kicking the can down the road, delaying the nuclear program by two or three years, because we are too afraid to have a meaningful and effective strategy in Washington. We're just relying on sanctions to appear to be doing something. That is an irresponsible use of both blood and treasure that would come at a huge expense of rallying the Iranian people around the flag. You're saying, Michael, you're saying that if we do have a military strike on, say, some limited nuclear facilities, then that would result in a rally to the flag? I do believe it would, and I understand that other people disagree and that this would be open for debate. Um, that said, what I'm arguing is if we are using military force to delay making a decision on more effective strategies back in Washington, then that would be irresponsible because it's just setting a stage like we had in um, Iraq for so long Right. Of, inter, um, of mowing the grass, of strikes every few years, um, because the problem then is within among the Democrats and Republicans in our own Congress, 
not being able to come to any meaningful decision on a long term strategy. Yeah. So let me let let's end on this uh, this last question for me. Um, I'm just personally very curious about this. When the um, um, this this Massa Amini revolution, the woman life freedom revolution, was at its apex. But as was was people were really highly mobilized. CNN was covering it all the time. The diaspora was having at least once per week um, protests in every major city around the world, practically almost. Um, did you perceive things differently then than you do now? Are any of the things that you said today, um, would you have said them differently or, or, or said the, something uh, opposite of what you said back then? No. No. No, okay, the, the, the all right. The biggest advantage of the women, woman life freedom movement has been for all those on the fence or all those not normally paying attention to Iran, there can be no doubt that the regime itself is no longer legitimate mm -hmm. in the eyes of the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. What I would hope is that the broader public, the media, all those who wanted to engage in track two dialogue, who mm -hmm. wanted to um, create false parallels that either you're, you're for the forum movement or you want war, will basically recognize that the outcome to any policy should not be the preservation of a regime that the Iranian people dislike and that has no legitimacy in their eyes. I mean, I would agree with that. I think the, uh, I think the, the movement that has sprung up since her death uh, has made it more difficult for the Western left. Um, yeah. I don't know if I go so far as to say embrace the regime, but uh, cut it a lot of slack. Right. Uh, so that in and of itself is is a good thing, because uh, I would argue the Western left really defines the debate on Iran. It's yeah. not the right. So uh, you know that that has that to, for what it's worth, that certainly has been an achievement of that movement. Yes. Okay. Danny, any last thoughts? This is where you're, you you have the last word. Muted. I'm sorry. I, I'll do that every single damn time. Um, I will say this as a note of optimism, um, not, not simply uh, the optimism that comes from a surprise event. I actually think that persistence um, on the part of policymakers who actually want to see something happen can actually um, can actually help. It can help unify the expatriate community. It can help unify people within within Iran who need to believe that we care about them. And you know, I I always tell everybody the same story, and I'll end with it. And it has nothing to do with Iran. You know, Cuba is, a, is an issue as near and dear to the hearts of Cuban expatriates in America as Iran is to, to Iranian expatriates. And Cuba represents a, a pretty substantial threat to the United States as well. And so now, now, now even more with the Chinese. Um, and we, uh, when I worked on Capitol Hill, we passed legislation um, that, that uh, we had legislation, I should say, that imposed a whole variety of very stringent, very effective sanctions that denied the Cuban regime a large amount of money. And Bill Clinton was the president of the United States. There's no way in hell he wouldn't have vetoed that piece of legislation, which is still in force today and which has absolutely put a stranglehold on the Castro and its successor regime. But what happened? The Cubans miscalculated a certain moment and they shot down the planes of Miami based, uh, a Miami based group called the Brothers to the Rescue. They did it in international waters. And the Clinton administration needed a response. And there was this piece of legislation waiting for them. And Bill Clinton signed it, and it is now the law of the land. You never know, once you tee up the right circumstances, what can happen and who in the regime can help you achieve those 
by miscalculating. So that's my note of optimism. The Iranians make lots of mistakes. We should be ready. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, thank you everyone for watching. And Danny, Ruel, Michael, thank you so much for your time, really. Thank Sorry you. for the technical troubles. Take yeah. care, Mariam. Bye, guys. Thank you. Ciao.